Okay, so hi everybody. So today for our weekly seminar, um, we are going to have uh, uh, Dr. Lea Marco Tulli. So just uh, to briefly introduce her. So Dr. Marco Tulli graduated with her PhD in physics from the Clemson University in May, 2021. And uh, she's currently an Einstein Fellow at the Yale University since uh, September 2021. Um, Leah is a high energy astrophysicist, and uh, her main research focuses in studying blazer at high redshift and uh, their connection to supermassive black hole growth, both through single sources studies and population studies at X and the gamma rays mostly. And uh, without any further ado, Please, Leah, thanks for being here today. All right. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so today, I will, uh, I will tell you a bit about what I've done throughout my PhD and what I'm doing now as postdoc. And again, it's mostly going to be focused on lasers. So just to put everybody on the same page, in case you don't really work with blazers, blazers are these uh, powerful AGNs, so supermassive black holes that are actively creating gas in their surroundings, and they're also capable of powering these extreme jets that, when pointed close to our line of sight, uh, are named blazers. So. Now, what I'm going to give you is sort of an overview of the source class and some of the open questions that we have about these kind of uh, sources. And then I'll later tell you what I've done first with my research to answer some of these questions. But let's start with an overview of their population. Because people have found that uh, with population studies, uh, this book is from the Indian in 2017, that these sources follow a sort of um, sequence if you, you, um, if you show them as function of luminosity, this is called plasma sequence. So what you're seeing right here in this plot, this is several SEDs of different uh, blazers detected at gamma ray. So the SED is just a luminosity versus first frame frequency. And if you look at them in the, if you group them in based on the upper luminosity, you start seeing that their SEDs, which extend from radio up to very high energy gamma rays, uh, for the luminosity sources, this purple line right here, their peaks of the SED speaks a very high frequency, it's very high energy. But as the source luminosity increases, you see that these two peaks shift towards lower and lower frequencies, just like this, okay? To a point that the most luminous objects of the class have their high energy peak peaking at MeV frequencies below 100 MeV right here, and therefore are referred to as MeV blazers. These sources are extremely powerful, reaching volumetric luminosities greater than 10 to the 48, 10 to the 49 power per second, extremely, extremely bright. And we can find them at very high redshift, even beyond redshift five. This tells you that these sources exist at the moment in time when the universe was barely one to two billion years old, extremely early on. And here you see a PS map of the one of the highest redshift lasers detected the gamma rays. Okay, extremely early on, extremely powerful, and also have are powered by extremely massive black holes. So this is a histogram of uh, in blue blazers detected below redshift three and in red of redshift of uh, blazers detected above redshift three and you can see that the histogram of their masses actually if you look at the sources of higher redshift peak at higher masses of like the average so higher the redshift higher black hole mass and now we're talking a moment in time where it's difficult to produce so many sources with such high masses so how did this black hole form so big so fast but of course, this kind of study strongly relies on the number of sources that you find per redshift bin, and also on the kind of evolution that you understand these sources to follow. So in terms of blazers, we usually think about uh, three kinds of evolution for the source class. So how do they evolve through time? And one of them is the idea that these sources evolve simply in density. This means that as you go further in time, the number of sources increases or decreases, but the luminosity in average of the source class Take more light. Those are little blazers. Or 
you can make a similar argument, but just in luminosity. So actually, in terms of number densities, they more or less the same. But as you go further in time, the luminosity increases or decreases. Or maybe the situation is a bit more complex. There is a mix of these two kinds of evolution. But if you find more and more sources of different redshift, of the highest one particularly, and you understand their evolution, and you know the masses of their black hole, then you can enclose this information in the supermassive black hole to density plot. This is shown uh, for black holes of masses uh, greater than 10 billion solar masses as function of redshift from the work of Barat et al. in 2015. Now, the authors of this work found that there was a dichotomy between radio quiet AGNs, so AGNs that don't really have strong radio emissions, so don't have very powerful jets, and radio loud ones, the uh, orange band shown here, which are laser light sources. The radio quiet population does speak around redshift 2, which is the so called cosmic noon, where most source classes are known to be in terms of their evolution. But if we do look at the radio loud source class, we see that they have a peak quite earlier on at a redshift about four. So really, really early, really, really early on in the history of the universe, we find this very powerful jetted AGN, which hints to the fact that there is a strong connection between a jetted phase of the AGN and a fast black hole growth. Sorry, what is Bach is the sweet uh, instrument? Yes. So in this plot, um, the authors, what they did to derive the space density of supermassive black hole, they took the uh, luminosity um, luminosity function of blazers detected by the Fermi lots mm -hmm. and by the Fermi bots. And they did with sweet bots. Yes. Um, sorry. And for those of you who are not super familiar, the Fermi lot is a gamma ray instrument, uh, while the sweet bot is a hard X ray instrument. That will. 100 K. And so they took these luminosity functions. And when you and when you talk about blazers, uh, you have a very, and this is why this is a very interesting for this kind of studies, is that for every blazer you detect, you're very lucky, right? You're looking down the barrel of the jet. But for every blazer you detect, you can, by geometrical arguments, infer the size of the population of the same blazers at the same redshift. Uh, but the widget pointing somewhere else, so it becomes very faint when you don't see them. And this is actually called the two gamma square correction, where gamma is the bulk Lorentz factor of the jet, which is telling you how fast these electrons are moving down the jet line. So if you know gamma, which usually is between 10 to 15, you can apply the two gamma square correction to the blazer luminosity function. So you just multiply by two gamma square, and then you get these lines. This is why uh, those are identified as gamma ray lasers, or when you see lap being gamma rays, when you see bat being x-rays. So here you have gamma ray lasers, and here you have x-ray lasers. And those different populations of lasers, lap and bat? I will tell you in a okay. slide, <laughs> but it's a very good point that you're making. Uh, but yes, yeah, so in this uh, sense, the sort of population for these specific uh, studies told us that we have a lot of black holes right here. Uh, and so at that uh, very early in time, and we need to understand how do they evolve uh, so fast uh, with such black holes. Another thing that lasers help us understand is the composition also of the so-called cosmic high energy background. Shown here in its intensity as function of energy, this is the integrated emission of all resolved and unresolved source classes that emit from soft X-rays up to gamma rays. And blazers have been understood to contribute uh, differently to different parts of these plots. For example, if we zoom in to the gamma ray part of things detected by the Fermi labs, gamma rays again, here are the data points for the so called extragalactic gamma ray background. And the gray shaded area is the contribution of blazers to this background. And so below 100 GV, they contribute about 30%, but if you go above at higher and higher energies, they contribute um, as more and more up to 50 or even 100 percent of the very high energy. So major contributors of the gamma ray background. In the low energy side of things, so from soft X-rays up to hard X-rays, this background, this is called cosmic X-ray background, is actually understood to be produced by AGNs that don't have jets. Actually, the major contributors are the so-called obscured or compound thick AGN that Nuria is uh, very fond of. But if we look at the hard X-ray regime, so above 10 kV, 
Blitzers contribute about 5 to 10 percent. They're understood to contribute this much. The same blazers that contribute this much to the X-ray background actually can are the ones that are predicted to contribute 100 percent of the MED background, which is this middle part of the plot that has not been explored since the 2000s. Because we don't have a new MED vision, we would love one to constrain this background and also that more and more. But we can use the information in X-rays to um, predict the contribution in MEDs. Now, if you like lasers, you know a lot about lasers. And one of the big questions in our community is blazer sequence, the sequence that I showed you at the beginning, is it real or is it a selection effect? Now, some you can be whatever side of the of this argument that you want, but ideally, what we need to confirm or disprove this theory is having a lot of sources in this part of the plot. Because if they, it was populated, then no blazer sequence. And a lot of, uh, if you work with blazers, you know that most uh, sources that have these high frequency peaks are BLF sources. So be, uh, blazers that don't have lines in their spectra, no lines, no edge, no luminous. So you don't know where they fall in these plots. And what, really what we would want is a bunch of sources that populate this area of plots. And some people have found candidates of this kind of sources. This was in 2012, it all uh, studied some of these Blue FSRQs or high luminosity BLAs. So sources that look like BLAs, no lines in their spectra, but you take the redshift photometrically and if they are at redshift 1.5, so above redshift 1. So extremely high luminosities. Uh, they have also high synchrotron peak, so really populating the part of the plot that I was showing, uh, high synchrotron luminosities, and high radio powers. And so the understanding of this, because those are more the characteristics of FSRQ sources. The idea would be that actually these are FSRQs, but the jet is so powerful that we don't see the lines in the spectrum. But actually, they are FSRQs and there should be a lot of them. So we need to find more and more sources. And in terms of the importance of this kind of source class, uh, well, first of all, again, we want to understand possible selection effect and understand the evolution. But maybe some of you may be interested in the so called extragalactic background light, which is. We we're talking about backgrounds. This is the integrated emission of all the sources, result and unresolved, that emit from infrared up to UV. So this light is very difficult to characterize directly. So you just point at the sky and measure it. So what you can do with gamma rays is that when a photon from your blazers interacts with an EBL photon, it gets annihilated through the same pairs. And in real life, what happens to the spectrum of your blazers is that you start. Uh, in gamma rays with a straight power law, and then all of a sudden you have a break. And if you can characterize this break, you can measure the EBL. So it's really important to understand this background of our universe. And here is an example of how this kind of business could help us understand better the theories behind it, because so here's a plot of the so-called cosmic uh, gamma ray horizon. So the point uh, in redshift where the universe would become opaque of photons of a certain energy, and you see here are the data points from um, back then, from the Fermilab catalog at that time. And those lines that you see are the different model prediction from EBL. Now, all of you may notice that all these lines are very well in agreement at very low redshift. But as we go increasingly in redshift, they tend to diverge quite significantly from each other. So if you start populating this part of the, this part of the spectrum, at least here, then you can actually constrain this model and you can have measurements from the data. And finally, if you're fond of the XSO506, the XSO506, the first um, blazer found in Queensland detection with the neutrino, this was found to be more likely one of these FSRQ, of this masquerading BLAC. So it is a BLAC in nature, but then when you look at the LCD and you make prediction for, you collect all the multiple wavelength data, it looked like to be more of an FSRQ. And last but not least, one of the other open questions in our community is, are these jets producing uh, radiation through, uh, are, are leptons basically responsible for all the emission that we see, are just electrons responsible for everything, or are protons or hydronic processes play an important role? This work from Boucher in 2013 modeled the same lasers with a leptonic and a hydronic model. 
Now, just by eye, can you tell me which one works best? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I would like to point out that we have a huge gap between the hard X-rays up to the Emily regime, which is where this kind of modeling predicts that there are extremely uh, different features in the two models. So if we could have some sort of coverage here, then we can make progress in understanding these combinations. All right, so now I gave you more or less of an overview of some of the organization in desert physics. And I will tell you now what I have done first for this talk. This talk is gonna be divided into two chapters. The first one is a bit more intense than the beginning and then the ones later on becomes a bit longer. So don't panic, it's gonna be okay. So right now, what we are gonna talk about is the evolution of MED places. Okay, so when we talk about the evolution of surface classes, what we need to do is perform a luminosity uh, function study, which tells you how many sources are there per luminosity beam per moving volume. Okay, so you try to trace them across time. What kind of uh, tools do you need? Well, at the we are talking luminosity, so first you need well, first of all you need lasers, then you need them uh, to have a flux measurement and a register. Okay. So to do this kind of study, what because we again we don't have an emission, we rely on the capability uh, capabilities of the old sky survey bots, uh, which covers from uh, 10, uh, 14 to 195 KV. And this is the old sky map from uh, the 105 month catalog from the instrument. And as you can see, the gray uh, dots are all the sources detected by the catalog, and the red uh, are our beloved blazers. And just by eye, you can see that blazers are not the major contributors. They're actually just 10% of the whole bank catalog, as we expected, but they're enough to do our sort of studies. Then, of course, you want to make some cuts to minimize uncertainties. For example, we avoid the galactic plane to avoid source confusion, and we only want sources that are detected above phi sigma. And then we need to take into account the biases of the survey. So every survey has its biases. And in case of the bot, this comes from its exposure. This is again the old sky, and this is um, color coded based on how much time it's been exposed. And you see that the gray areas are less exposed, and for 10 megaseconds, and then uh, the whitish areas are the ones that have been exposed for more time. Of course, if you look at a certain part of the sky for longer, you will see deeper in terms of flux. And so you need to remember that there is this bias in your survey in terms of sources that you detect. And this information is encapsulated in the so-called sky coverage of your instrument, which is shown here as function of flux. And you can think of this as the probability that your instrument will detect sources above a certain significance at a certain flux somewhere in the sky. So of course, at high fluxes, this is basically one. So it detects sources everywhere. And then it slowly, slowly decreases as the flux decreases to a point where we are, when we are at the limiting flux of 5, 10 to the minus 12. If you see one source with that flux, this tells you that there should be a hundred more sources at the same flux that we are not seeing, not because they're not there, but because our instrument is hampering that reduction. So you need to correct your observed catalog by these biases. But once you know your uh, source, your catalog, you know your biases. Last thing you need to have is some luminosity function models to model your population. And again, those are the same ones that I talked at the beginning. Jumping into the results, here you see the most up to date extra luminosity function of lasers, MED lasers, to the left as function of redshift and to the right as function of luminosity. And there are three main takeaway points I wanted to take from this slide. One is that we confirm that these source class evolve positively in back. This means that there are more or more luminous sources as we go higher in range. Then our FED confirms that the peak of their evolution is actually at redshift 4.3. So we are going above redshift 4. And for the very first time doing this study, we had a source at Reggie 4.6, so above Reggie 4. Previously, we didn't have any source above Reggie 4, which could have brought this distribution down and told us that the peak was earlier on. But that source confirms that our peak is at Reggie 
Is the luminosity the buff luminosity or is the multi wavelength? This is only the buff luminosity oh. for this. So, this is only we're talking about the actual luminosities. And third main takeaway point is that if you look at this luminosity function as function of luminosity, no matter the redshift beam that you're looking at, our function is a power. Now, being a power node, it means that we cannot discern yet whether our uh, source class is evolving in density or in luminosity because they're equivalent to each other. What ideally we would like to have is a sort of gray appearing in all these different redshifts that we could follow through time and that would tell us whether the source is evolving in density or luminosity. And if you look carefully in the lowest redshift bin, you see that the model sort of predicts this break right here at the lowest luminosities, but Statistically speaking, if you just I mean, if you look at the data, those are consistent to be just a straight power. So we cannot make um, strong claims for for this kind of evolution. So we don't know whether it's one or the other. Nevertheless, we can start answering some of the questions that we were talking about at the beginning. For example, contribution to uh, the cosmic X-ray background. You see here again, it's the plot of the CXP plus the MED background as well added there. Blue is prediction from the density evolution model, uh, pink uh, from the luminosity evolution one. And we see that uh, in the X ray regime, so here, but here you, uh, they contribute about 2 to 10%, depending on the model. But if you look in the MED range, so if we extrapolate the luminosity function into the MED regime, these sources contribute 70 or predicted to contribute 70 to 100 percent. So most of them in background. And we know that some other source classes contribute in this regime. So if you want to make some arguments, you can say, okay, maybe the luminosity evolution is better fitting the, the, the background because it allows contribution from mm -hmm. other source class. But the errors are so large that again, you cannot make any strong claims. And another fun thing you can do with luminosity function studies is that you can sort of infer um, the distribution of, in this case, uh, Lorentz factors. We also did it for viewing angles of these glitter jets. And this is informative because we always have in our head two gamma square correction, right? So we want to know what gamma really is for this population. And so using the luminosity function, we could derive the probability distribution of gamma, which told us that it, actually the average is around. Eight, depending on the feed, it's a complicated feed, but depending on the feed, it's still like below 10 for most of the ones that we've done. And I would like to point out that usually people, when they use two gamma square for the high luminosity sources, always use gammas of 15. That's a lot. Two gamma square is like almost 500 more sources. But if your gamma is lower, say even 10, you're actually predicting 200 sources. So that plays a huge role into this population study of uh, black holes. And if we just look at the number densities of sources function of redshift, uh, in the dotted line here was the prediction from the previous work on the same uh, kind of sources by Ayala in 2009. Our luminosity function predicts quite like a factor of two less number of sources uh, at this kind of redshift, sorry, above redshift four. And if you combine this information together, so lower number densities, probably lower gamma factors, then you see that the peak of this distribution here, though still being there at redshift 4.3, it will go down in terms of numbers. Okay. We have not redone this plot for, for this new luminosity function, but again, things point to the fact that the numbers um, could be a bit lower. And finally, in terms of predictions for uh, MEV emissions, we love MEVs. Uh, and if any of you is any of the panels that one day would decide if any of you can fly, say yes. Because here, for races, it would be fantastic. So using the extra luminosity function um, extrapolated to the MEV regime, what we could derive is the source count distribution of lasers in different MEV events. So this is the number of sources per plots. And make prediction for some missions. So pick your favorite mission with uh, your sensitivity, draw a straight line, this would tell you the number of sources that your instrument will detect uh, if you were to apply for some number of years. 
And I would like to point out that the first instrument is the Fermi Nut, which has been in orbit since 2008 and does have a sensitivity in the 20 MeV region. This is going to come back in a few slides. And the predictions are about almost a thousand sources uh, for the later class. Then we have COSI, which actually has been approved that will be launched in 2027. We'll do a little bit for blazers, but what we would really like in missions like Amigo, Amigo X, Astronaut, we we'll detect a bunch of sources. And also, we could make prediction of if one of these missions would fly at some point and would see our lasers, what is the probability that in the time span of the mission, we would detect um, a coincident neutrino from one of these lasers? Because enemy lasers are also predicted to be uh, neutrino emitters. So our predictions, it, they're very conservative. They don't take into account flares and they do take into account some assumption of neutrinos and uh, gamma ray flux of the sources. But you see that we go from two coincident neutrinos up to maybe 11, but loss is a, would be theoretically a very, very sensitive. So there is some hope for neutrino detection from the enemy lasers. To answer your question before, I uh, removed that slide because I thought it was too much details. But basically, what we see is that, let me find an extra slide, please. I think I put it. Uh, here. That's a slide that kind of um, could answer your question. Now, what we did as well in this work is to understand whether bats, so are cardiac ray detected lasers and gamma ray detected lasers, are they the same population or are they different? So, what we did is made an average LCDs for our um, sources, the X ray detected one, and this one was from the work of Ayala in 2012. And what we see is if you just look at the red curves, no matter the luminosities, the shape of the spectral energy distribution of these lasers at these high energies is more or less the same. So we have an average idea of what this distribution is. And similarly, for the FSR use detected in gamma rays. Okay, so they follow the same trend. But the peak, average peak of the two distribution is shifted for uh, gamma ray detected sources to higher energies, and they're a bit lower in luminosities. Okay. Then, if you look at the evolution of gamma ray lasers from here, you see how these sources actually have the, the high luminosity ones peak around redshift two, which is a bit different than our blazes of beta redshift four, right? And also, uh, with the study of a uh, source gun distribution of the blazer class, we kind of saw that the density evolution could be more um, favorable for this population. This was like a, um, an argument based on uh, just overplotting some luminosity functions. So question is, are these sources the same kind of source there or are they different? What we came up with is the idea that they are the same kind of sources, but possibly what we're trying to see is a sort of trend that could follow a bit of the AGM downsizing scheme where you have very luminous, very massive black holes very early on. And then as you go, along with redshift, they decrease in luminosity. They're still the same kind of source, same properties as in the physics, but they decrease in luminosity and mass of the black holes because we're also seeing these at the high redshift one, which are these two guys are the highest black one. Again, and way the argument is nothing. Uh, but they're all flat spectrum radio lasers. Yes. So the plot that you should decode with the two hands. Yes. They are all flat spectrum radio lasers. Yes. Yes, yes. So for, you mean for the supermassive black holes with density? Uh, that, that plot with the, um, the two hands uh, with the bath. Uh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Bath. Exactly. So this one, I'll pick it up again. Um, no? This one. Yes. Yes. So for these kind of studies, uh, usually, and you can see it here, that it's labeled as which kind of luminosity gap would they use. So here, they use the highest luminosity sources from the uh, lab laser cues and the bottom laser cues. It's always the same population. Because yes. the assumption, again, and another assumption in this plot is gamma factors 15, and every source that has this extra luminosity has a mass of the black hole greater than 10 to the 9. And every source of this luminosity in gamma has a mass greater than 10 so this is also a certain assumption. Now, when we look at single source of studies, what we are trying to find, where we are finding is that indeed, in terms of mass of the black holes, these holes, so these kind of luminosity sources have the high mass black holes, 
In terms of gamma factors, even when you look at single sources at high reg, if you start seeing that the gamma factors are a bit lower than the theoretical 15 that everybody could see them for very high reg. Mm -hmm. So again, this distribution may be a bit lower than previously done, but we are comparing apples to apples. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, let me go back to here. Okay, so because we are kind of in that route, another thing that, so the uh, heavy part of the book is done. Now it's a more uh, light version of it. So of course, it's great to have an idea of how the sources are distributed throughout time in Oxygen. But what we also need to find is more and more sources, mostly at a very high rate, okay, to confirm all these theories and what we think is happening at those distances. And to do so, uh, we are hitting a point where, again, we don't have an elimination, so we're not sampling the peak, so it's very difficult to see them, although these sources are extremely bright. Our strategy was uh, to start with the detection in the gamma ray band by the Fermi LA peak. This again covers from 50, but possibly 20 MeV up to 2 MeV. And if you have the gamma ray detection of these sources at high redshift, what you're able to do is actually constrain the falling part of their SED um, at high energies. Now, because we're going to see this plot again and again, I want to uh, bring everybody up to speed. So this is again a uh, spectral energy distribution of the high redshift lasers, flux versus frequency radio up to gamma ray. All the data points that you see are gray ones are just archival data points and red ones are the ones that we have collected, we will collect it and I will tell you which instrument we use, gamma ray data. And then all the lines that you see are modeling lines for the source, assuming a one zone leptonic model if you're familiar with this uh, modeling of laser sources. At low energies, you have contribution from synchrotron emission of the electrons in the jet. And the high energies, you have contribution of external Compton emission, same electrons, finding photons around them, upscattering them to high energies. So this tells us a lot about the jet. And then for these sources of high redshift, because the two peaks shift to lower and lower frequencies, we start seeing contribution from the accretion disk. So right here in the optical uh, UV regime, what you see is the accretion disk of the sources that then you can model as well. So when you add them all together, this modeling is the blue line that you see right here. And what we're really interested on is understanding the jet. So we want coverage at uh, high energies. We have gamma rays. And then we back for time with NUSER, two proposals. And if we're lucky enough, NUSER covers from 380 kV and it's very sensitive. So way more than the BAT telescope. And allows us to sample the spectral energy distribution up to very close to the peak of the emission. So when you have X-rays and gamma rays, you put them together, you can really constrain the high energy part of things, constrain the peak position. So you can say, yes, this is an MEV laser. And then you can tell, we can tell what is the jet power, what is the gamma factor, what is the viewing angle, and all these sort of things. But then, of course, lasers are multi-band emitters and they're very, very variable. So what we try to do is go as simultaneously as possible with a number of facilities. We uh, submit SWIFT POs uh, to get XRP data and new mod data, and then we had access to uh, optical telescopes that can follow, um, that can sample the accretion disk. So here you see that the XRP data complements very well the NUSA one. So we can really, again, tell properties of the jet and the particle distribution behind its emission. While the optical unit side of things samples the accretion disk simultaneously, okay? All of these simultaneous observations. And if you can model the accretion disk, you can infer its luminosity and the mass of the black hole. Now, some of these sources have masses measured spectroscopically, but some don't. But if you can measure the accretion disk, the luminosity uh, points, you can actually infer the mass of the black hole. And we saw that those methods are quite in agreement with each other. So we get masses of the black holes. So this was, we studied uh, eight to nine sources with these methods, but we are reaching a very uh, difficult point, which is going beyond red 4 with the LAT. Because LAT, now these sources are, the, the shift in their peaks is so much that they don't, we don't see them anymore at gamma rays. They just are not. So what we try to do instead is just use the capabilities of NUSTER. So I uh, 
I submitted a proposal last year now uh, to observe 11 high redshift blazer beyond redshift 4 from a blazer catalog. And all of them have been observed and I'm working on them at the moment. And again, the strategy is the same. We don't have lab, but we can have looser, hard X-rays, soft X-rays, optical data. And the only thing is that now we're reaching a point where sources are very faint. And when you ask for time for any instrument, you try to ask for the minimum minimum detectable time because otherwise you don't get a word of anything. So now my source is very, very faint. And you see that this is the field of view of looser. You see that with respect to the background, it's not uh, very, very strong. So the step right now that I'm working on is to actually um, understand the background behind these sources to extract as much information as possible from that signal. So of course, I'm using a test source, which is very bright. And the idea is if any of you deals with NUSER data, there is a tool called NUSCA Background. It's a Python package that you can use. And that allows you to, of course, you take a source uh, region in the background area, and that looks, that's the spectrum of it. And then you apply a model that is more complicated than the normal uh, tools from NUSER. And you have all the components of the backgrounds, which is cosmic X-ray background and then instrumental components of it. So uh, right, right now I'm at the point that I know how to model the background. I just need to take it and input it into my source spectrum and see if I can get more signal from it. So soon we'll have another 11 new MEB blazers in the in the sky. Okay. If you're not convinced that MEBs are great, let me tell you what you can do with them besides blazers. In general, of course, yeah, the intergalactic lab is where mostly going to be dominated by laser sources. But if any of you works with galactic sources, there are some populations that have been predicted to emitting the MEB band. Supernova remnants, MS binaries, pulsars, and maybe a source class that we are yet to see appear in the sky. Because again, since the 2000s, we don't really have a clear view of this energy band. And indeed, this was the map from Comtel that you can see they detected about 30 sources total in the sky, half were blazers, half were galactic origin. So a lot of improvements in this energy regime. And people from the Fermi lab, so the gamma ray instrument that I was telling you about, decided to try to make a catalog of low energy sources using data from 30 to 100 MEV. And in their study, they detected about 200 sources above crystal. Now, if any of you is familiar with Fermilab analysis, they, okay, they use eight years of data. They did not use any diffuse emission model, which if gamma rays, you're really dominated by systematic security models that are not really well understood. And they could do it because they use a so-called wavelet detection algorithm that didn't use, that uh, can avoid using the diffuse emission model. But they had some promising results. So we decided to take their uh, low energy catalog and improve on it using more data and a different uh, algorithm of detection. So this work, I need to say, it's done mostly by a graduate student at Clemson University, Scott Joffrey. And here you see the Fermi Sky account mass between 20 to 200 MEV. And if you just, this is with 12 years of data, I think at this point, but if you look at it, you can see by eye sources appearing. So this is your galactic thing. Those are little laser sources appearing. So there is a lot of potential right there. And we are working on an analysis to, uh, that we cover the whole sky and analyzes all the different regions and extracts our new catalog. So in our case, we use an energy band from 20 to 200 MeV. We use 14 years of data. A maximum likelihood method of detection of the sources, which is more of the standard way to detect sources in Fermi Labs. And we do use galactic diffuse and isotropic emission. So these are going to play with our systematics, but they are there and we will know how to deal with it. And our preliminary results show that we have more than a thousand sources above per sigma detection. 300 above per sigma, more than a thousand above per sigma. Most of them are extragalactic, so they're going to be our laser sources. And some of them are galactic as well. And right now, the status of the, there you can see the distribution of spectral indices. So we have a bit of a harder spectral index than the 4FGL shown in blue. But what we're working right now with is understanding the systematics of our positional uncertainty, as well as um, just some details of the analysis that need to be optimized. But preliminary results are very, very good. So we are hoping 
to uh, submit this catalog soon to the community. Like 800 new yeah. blazers. No. no. Uh, good point. No. 800 blazers. Yes. What we are trying to do now is match them I with mean, the first gen. Okay. Okay. The, the deck new. And I think the preliminary result is that about 300 are new blazers. I mean, when it's like this. That's a uh, oh. That's a uh, <laughs> Exactly. So hopefully, uh, again, what we're doing now is trying to really um, understand our positional uncertainties because that will do the cross much better and we'll understand what are the associated counterparts and all of this, but uh, it looks good. So far, so good. So if you like any of the galactic sources or extragalactic, stay tuned for this catalog, which will also be great for a mission that, like COSI, that we launched in 2027, because it will have a map of the sky and we will know what sources we should be able to see in this diagnostics. And finally, this is the last part of the talk. Let's talk a little bit about the broader blazer science that I introduced at the beginning. For example, this famous blazer sequence, selection effect or not. Again, for this kind of sources, what we want to find is more and more sources that are real like light. Find the redshift and see if they're above redshift one. So to do this kind of studies, what you do is apply a photometric redshift technique using a dropout in the UV spectrum of the sources. Because so this is the observed wavelengths so of UV up to optical. Because um, from the source to us, there is of course the lambda alpha forest that um, absorbs these kind of photons. And so if you can characterize the dropout through modeling of uh, like complex, I, I did not do this in terms of modeling, so I don't know exactly the detail. But if you can model the dropout, this tells you the redshift of the sources, so that you see that we have sources quite high redshift. And once you have found some of these VLACs at this high redshift, what you need to do is SUV modeling. And we've talked about EVL, so this extragalactic background light that absorbs your photon at high energies. So you cannot really use the gamma ray part of things because some of it is already absorbed by things in between you and the source. So what you're trying to do is get as much data as possible between optical up to X-ray part of things. Because if you can constrain this part of the spectrum, then you can make prediction of the gamma ray side of things, and you know what your source looks like. And this was work done by uh, now a doctor, uh, Megashi Rajagopal, who uh, analyzed this source, high redshift, high luminosities, high radio powers. We took simultaneous data from optical UV up to X-rays, and we could completely characterize the synchrotron part of the SUV and make prediction for the high energy part of things. So we tried a simple synchronous stereo compound, compound model, which is usually explains better VLX kind of object. And then we did the FSR2 part of things, which is external compound issue. These are the blue lines, okay? Now, of course, then we, what we could do is apply it one of the EVL models and see what, how much it will absorb our predicted emission. And you see that the line, the yellow line really follows through the lab data. So this is really EVL absorption playing at this but by modeling, we couldn't tell whether it was more of a VLAC or an FSR2. They were really equivalent to each other. So for now, we are just trying to get more and more sources. And to do so, I would like to shout out to the great effort going on at Clemson at the moment uh, in the past few years to obtain photometric and spectroscopic regions of VLAC sources. Uh, this is another grad student at Clemson, Yang Shen, who uh, did his work and found several other sources to populate these plots. Uh, so again, cosmic gamma ray horizon, we see that now we have more and more sources populating this redshift area right here. And so we picked one and with another grad student at Camp, so Gary Maraj Guru, she will look at the source, high redshift, high synchrotron peak, all of this, and we will redo the SD modeling and we will try to understand what these sources are like. Finally, to talk slightly about the hadronic and the conic models. This is again an SED of TXS 506, but not at the time where it was detected in coincident with um, the neutrino emission, but people looked back at the flare in 2014 and found again some neutrino emission from this source. But in 2014, nobody was looking at it. So we don't really have any coverage whatsoever of any wavelengths. But with different models, you see that a very crucial part of the spectrum to understand which one is preferred would be this middle area right here, right? So 
I would encourage you to vote for emission and quality experience in the vault that we propose to NASA. Uh, Nuri is also involved in it. Uh, so this is a mission that we are trying to push, which will cover simultaneously from 0.1 to 150 kV with two instruments on board. Hopefully it will be accepted, but right now for the Blitzer stuff, we are running simulations and things seem to be looking pretty nice. So in terms of blazers, what we could do is several things. So this is not actually a blazer, this is a radio galaxy, but this is a radio galaxy is detected up to 10 um, TV energies, this is 10A. And right now, if you look at the new star image of the source, you see just a moment. Well, hex we would have the capabilities of imaging the jet and understanding the particle acceleration mechanism and radiation mechanism happening in this kind of source. In terms of variability studies of lasers, it would be crucial because covering these two energy regimes simultaneously, these are prediction. Uh, so these are simulated light curves from HEC, that HEX we could see uh, from the low energy telescope and high energy telescope. And these were produced using a magnetic reconnection model. So some sort of acceleration in the jet. And you can see that this kind of instrument would sample really, really well. And if this process was taking place, we would actually be able to sample it with the timing capabilities of our instrument. And then if you really like extremely high peak blazers that would be in the area where CPA would be sent right here, actually high speed would be able to see them a very low fluxes and we will characterize the population. We just know like four or three of them. So HEX, we will see many, many of them. And again, could be used in coordination with CPA and see and characterize these sort of sources. But let's not forget that we will have COSI soon enough, if everything goes well, which also covers an important part of the spectrum. And if some of you are involved, of course, we already have IXPE, which is a great instrument because it's a polarimetry instrument in top X-ray band that can actually tell us a lot about the particle composition of the jets, as well as acceleration mechanism. Like several people have studied several papers using IXPE and published very interesting results. So just to conclude, just wanted to let you know that blazer science is still up and running. It's great. So I leave you here with sort of summary slide and if you have any questions. Thank you. Um, so any questions? <laughs> this is my question. The fact that we detect neutrinos, mm -hmm. uh, does that hint towards the hadronic model? Yes, uh, it does. Does it exclude the hadronic model? No, because uh, people have tried to study the pair of the excess of the six with hadronic modeling and they are not able to reproduce the simultaneous uh, SCB from that. So our question is first, do we believe in neutrino detection being really coincident with that? And if it is, if it's really the one from that specific place, why are we not able to reproduce the neutrino fact? Why is it so high and why none of our models are able to match? Is it because our models are wrong or is it because the detection is not in the brain? So what we want is more neutrino detection in coincidence with the one does make for excluding some of them. Not really. yeah, regarding the selection effects of the of the blast of the sequence, in that the plot that I asked you before, the one with two arms, you know, with a spectral radio process, where are I reshift the lack to will fall? Where where I reshift the lux will fall? They would fall in the upright corner, which is the part that will disprove the layers. No, no, I mean the, the one with the two arms. Um, Okay, this is, mm, they would not contribute a lot to that plot because what the VLX that we study usually, well, again, you don't see the emission from the accretion disk, so constraints on the black hole are very difficult to put, but usually these kind of sources are predicted to have low masses black holes, so not 10 to the four, 10 to the nine black hole masses, which is what the plot will show. Well, I think you predict low masses because you you have the one at low redshift that are right. less luminous. So a high high redshift deluxe would also have a, a 
a large mass from the gold. Good. I mean, that's that's why these modelings are important to do because if you look at this SED, mm -hmm. uh, we I think uh, the referee asked us this. But they were like, okay, but can you? I mean, this is just the SSC modeling. But if you look at the, I think I have it as an extra slide. Um, if you look at the here, so at the external Compton modeling, which would be more at this, if you like, you see that now you started having the contribution from the disk. So if you can constrain this, you could constrain again a the The thing is that the only thing we could put is yeah. upper so, limit because we have the so usually the assumption that we have to get the disk of 10 to the 45 and a mass of um, 5 10 to the 8, mm -hmm. something like this. But again, we don't have strong constraints on this. However, if we could somehow just using the jet properties constraint, whether this model is more likely than the SSC one, then we could start thinking about the black hole. Mm -hmm. But uh, right now we don't have enough uh, data or statistics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you for the talk. I have a question which is not related to like that part. Mm -hmm. It's very much about whole mass, but yeah. the mass distribution for lower edge of the height is good. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this one. Yes, probably it's a naive question, but. Why at higher rates if the mass of the spinal muscular hole tends to be high? I mean, which, what kind of evolution models can we play? That's, that's a very good question. Like, first of all, I would like to point out that there is a bit of a selection effect just already in this spot because when you go to high redshift, you are more likely to see the most powerful person, so the ones actually powered by most massive black holes. So you're already biased in that effect. Nonetheless, these sources exist with these models and those numbers. So we really have a lot of design mass black holes and we need to explain how they form. The formation and evolution of these sources is tricky to constrain. Some ideas is that just because just simple, simple accretion does not explain for these high masses and those redshift for this number of sources. And some of the ideas uh, that people have is that merger, for example, could be a good viable way to have more of this mass black hole at this high redshift. So, Problem is when you go at this higher edge, what you see in your image is a point. So you cannot really distinguish any morphology or any details of your sources. Although these kind of uh, lasers are usually uh, hosted by evolved elliptical galaxies, by uh, morphological studies, uh, people have found this. So the idea is that ellipticals are again byproducts of merger activity. So what we are trying to do is actually look closer to us to low power jets. So these so-called gamma ray narrow line super galaxies. So those are spiral galaxies that host an AGN, which has a jet as well, but it's very, very low power with respect to uh, later ones. And one of our collaborators, what he found is that he studied a particular system and he saw that the system was in a merger state. So we did see two of these galaxies like they were that are in the process of merging and the jet is younger than the merger. This tells you that the jet is triggered at some point throughout this merger events. But what, so the idea is that we have only one and we're trying to get more and more sources locally ones and whether this is a viable way to have this kind of masses at those by range. Yeah, but if we can have such a high mass, for example, for pirates, why we don't observe them in flowers, which is relatively easy? I mean, that is a that's that's also a very good good point that you're making. Um, you have maybe uh, they're not as bright any, anymore. We don't have these powerful jets. We don't detect them, or uh, we are limited just by our volume and we don't see them here. But I don't know how to answer that question exactly. There are people that say that probably the plasma sequence is the um, evolution sequence. Yeah. So yeah. maybe. A higher redshift, uh, the, 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 the mission of the blazer was triggered by this merger event, and this blazer said a lot of the fuel and activity material, and then they, they, they consumed it. And then some would say the flat federal weather may become the last during the evolution, and so they, they kind of dim out and they become less and less luminous. 
And so even uh, um, very large uh, black holes may have consumed oh, all, the, all the all the all the material, and so they don't shine anymore. That's what we are. The thing is that again, you don't see them; you don't measure their masses anymore because. I mean, you, you will have to use other arguments than just spectroscopy from emission lines. You you need to characterize the system very well to learn the mass. But it's it, it's a very good method. Try to find these black holes in these matches. Okay, like global. Okay. So I think we can stop here and thanks again. <laughs>